morning, everyone. Welcome to a St. Augustine Catholic Church Bible study here in Washington, D.C. I'm Father Patrick Smith, pastor here at St. Augustine. And uh, we're studying the first letter of John uh, in the New Testament, toward the end of the New Testament. And uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> we're going to be beginning chapter four uh, today. It's only um, you know, four or five chapters, so uh, we're we'll beginning chapter four. But as always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Lord, we give you thanks for rather than gathering us together. Remind us with two or three gather in your name, you're present in our midst. So Lord, attune our ears to your voice, uh, our heart to the promptings of your spirit, uh, our minds uh, attune uh, direct toward your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, so that the word that we study may truly be not an exercise, simply an intellectual exercise, but truly an encounter with he who is the word of God. And may the word that we, that we learn also become flesh and flesh in the lives that we live. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and water this time. <clears throat> uh, well, again, also just uh, welcome again to everyone. Welcome back to those who have been uh, journeying with us. And welcome, uh, if anyone's here for the first time, um, I should welcome and some of you who are parishioners of St. Augustine know that we have a seminarian uh, who's been uh, assigned to St. Augustine for the next uh, seven weeks. Uh, his name is uh, Greg Zingler. So uh, uh, welcome, Greg. And uh, hopefully, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's a new face we have today. So I'm sure there are others as well. So we've been journeying through uh, 1 John. Um, and um, uh, we're going to uh, really pick up with... Um, uh, let's see, just some of the, um, so we've uh, uh, certainly been uh, seeing how um, <clears throat> uh, throughout, particularly in this third chapter of how um, it is, how, how loving one another, beginning with verse 11, how, you know, this whole call to, that loving one another is the ultimate proof that we are his disciples. Uh, is a, you know, we did, uh, it's not uh, simply as, in, it's fully captured in, uh, Verse um, 18, we focused on last week. Little children, let us not love in word or speech. Let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. So again, that was a really important theme. Uh, and then the verse, next line, by this we shall know that we are of the, of the truth and reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. But God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So we reflected on, <clears throat> and, and on that um uh, yeah, if we looked at the verse, we looked at the footnote, uh, 19 to 20, and I'm going to take one more glance at that. Um, and down in the second part, which says uh, the idea, the idea seems to be that Christians, despite being conscious of their shortcomings in life, that's referring to condemning ourselves, we can stand before God at the judgment with confidence in the superabundance of his mercy. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, the footnote for 320, the heart that convicts a believer is of sin is beating with the truth. It was an interesting phrase. The heart that convicts a believer of sin is beating with the truth. You remember earlier in the first chapter, of John, it said anyone who says uh, that uh, you have no sin, he says is a liar. And when he makes a mockery of the fact that God sent his son to deliver us from sin. So when it, so that's when that verse says uh, that, that footnote, the heart that convicts a believer of sin is beating with the truth. If we tend not to be honest with ourselves, usually it's about uh, anything uh, lacking, you know, that, uh, you know, that I'm not smart enough or I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, <clears throat> uh, to think of, uh, I'm not uh, equipped enough or, or I am, I'm guilty of something, you know, I have flaws, you know, one of the, uh, <clears throat> what seemed to be uh, one of the um, challenging uh, 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 sacraments of the seven sacraments uh, that in some of which you can repeat, you know, we don't repeat baptisms, we don't re repeat confirmations, but communion, penance, confession. What's remember confession is uh, it, it's kind of, it, it goes against often um, the, uh, what will be our first instinct. You know, we don't, when we're accused of something, <clears throat> let's say, um, not good, we tend to make excuses. We, we ex excuse ourselves. Well, I'm an exception, you know, I, these are the reasons. If, if this didn't happen, I wouldn't have done that. 
but the act of con confessing is something uh, not uh, very common, is where we literally go to confession to accuse ourselves. It's not someone else accusing me. No, I'm here to accuse myself of the following sins. You know, I failed to show charity in this way. You know, I was really unkind to this person. I, you know, I, <clears throat> whatever it is, you're literally, there's no one who, you know, you don't have a, even for children, it's not like we invite the parent in, okay, tell us what this child did. No, confession is you being honest, being uh, maybe uncharacteristically honest, or certainly in our world, where I'm not afraid to admit where I have fallen short, where I have sinned um, through my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. If anyone who does that sincerely, like when we celebrate, we say the Confederate Mass, I confess, it, think about it, it's no excuses. I confess Almighty God, and also to you, my brothers and sisters, I've greatly sinned. My thoughts and my words and what I've done, what I've failed to do, it's not my fault. Why are we so bold to be that transparent, even among others? It implies that we have a confidence in the extraordinary and uh, you know, a mercy of God. That if we, with a humble and contrite heart, the Psalms say, he will not spurn. If we are just willing to be honest and open, that's, those are the ones who experience mercy. God offers mercy for all, but not everybody takes him up on his offer. You know, if I'm like, I'm cool, I'm fine, I didn't do anything, wasn't me, we don't get mercy because we don't even come for it. Okay, so <clears throat> so that they get that verse, again, we're saying that when we actually, when my heart convicts me of sin, it's actually beating with the truth. It's telling, just telling the truth. Uh, that, foot, that footnote again continues, um, uh, the, the, it, it, uh, it responds with contrition and immediately seeks forgiveness from Christ. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, and then the, um, yeah, and it says uh, in verse 19, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So the footnote there, God is greater. God has the power to cleanse our conscience and restore our confidence to approach him prayerfully with our needs. Let me read that slower again. God has the power to cleanse our conscience and restore our confidence to approach him prayerfully with our needs. Uh, I tell you, there's nothing like the guilt of sin to kill your confidence, uh, to make you less likely to, you know, it's like hasten to his throne, run to his throne of grace. Well, people are dragging their feet many times. It's like, there's nothing like unconfessed sin, holding on to the guilt and shame that really slows us down, that kills our confidence. Um, it's precisely by coming into his presence acknowledging our sins, experiencing forgiveness that makes us confident, you know, to be able to continue to walk uh, in his grace. Um, there's a footnote there, I mean, there's a, a reference to a catechism number 208. I just wanna share uh, the catechism on this, on this topic. Uh, and it's, it's number 208. And let me, uh, let's go. Number 208. <clears throat> let's see. It's under the profession of faith. Let's see. Yeah. Maybe it's under professional fee. Sorry, I I lost my original tab. Oh, it's okay. okay. Paragraph numbers. Here we go. Good. Number 208, um, faced, faced with God's fascinating and mysterious presence, man discovers his own insignificance. It'll follow, follow, make that, the follow and make it make sense. So faced with God's fascinating, mysterious presence, human beings discover uh, their own insignificance. Before the burning bush, Moses takes off his sandals and veils his face in the presence of God's holiness. Before the glory of the thrice holy God, Isaiah cries out, woe is me, I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips. Before the divine sign dropped by Jesus, Peter exclaims, depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. But because God is holy, he can forgive the one, the man who realizes that he is a sinner before him. Quote, I will not execute my fierce anger, for I am God and not man. 
the Holy One in your midst. The Apostle John says, likewise, this is the verse we came from, we shall reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Okay, so the idea is that when you, if you stand, if you've ever, um, let's say, gone to work or gone somewhere and you realize when you walked out into the sun that, oh my goodness, there's a stain on my shirt or my blouse, uh, or I got two different socks on, two different color socks, you thought you had one color. How did you know that? You stepped into the light, a bright light, like sunlight. And that's when you realize, so when you step into the light of God, it's going to reveal how much I'm not like God. I mean, I'm in God's image, but how I have flaws, I have sinfulness, I have scars from from my uh, you know from my rebellion with God, whatever. But it so it reveals. But think of God's light and God's love, like you know, the brightest room in a hospital is probably where they do surgery. They have special lights, so they don't miss anything. Now, why are they shining on this light on you? to laugh at you, to condemn you, to point out, boy, what kind, what a, look at this person's liver. Well, look at their pancreas. Well, look at their lungs. What a mess. That's not what the doctors and nurses are doing around that table. They put all this light so they don't miss, they see everything, especially the flaws, especially the source of dis-ease, especially the things that are threatening your welfare and your health and even your life, precisely so they can fix it. They can take out what is a threat to you, you know, a tumor, a cancer, or something. Uh, they can mend what is broken, you know, stop the bleeding. So all that light is on you that reveals your flaws, but not to condemn you. It's like so when Isaiah stepped into the light of when he inherited the angel say, "Holy, holy, holy," he says, "Oh God, I don't belong here. I don't deserve to be in your presence. You are so holy, so bright that it reveals what I'm lacking." Moses is like, come no further. You're on holy ground. Oops, I didn't, I didn't realize why I was stepping. Holy ground. You know, God is holy. Do I, why am I here? Why should I be here? Uh, in fact, God summoned Moses into his presence. God summoned Isaiah. So he wanted them there. And uh, but their first reaction was, again, that, you know, boy, look at what, you know, God is so, God is so holy and I lack holiness. You know, God is perfect. I am imperfect. God is pure. I have impurities. You know, it's like that. So you see, God is all wise. You know, I'm ignorant of many things. And so, but because God is, as, as we're going to read explicitly in this chapter, God is love. I don't have to be afraid to come to his presence with all my flaws. Because he is love, I am free. Is his love cast out the fear so I can step in his presence. So important that we do, but we'll get, I'm jumping ahead. Okay, so uh, so let's start now with um, with chapter four. Uh, the title in our, in our uh, workbook is, um, again, Testing the Spirits. Um, so verse four, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. <clears throat> and every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you heard that it was that it was coming, and now it is in the world already. Little children, you are of God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, what they say is of the world. And the world listens to them. We are of God. Whoever knows God listens to us. And he who is not of God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. Um, <clears throat> So it's always good again to start with a footnote on uh, what it says about for uh, four one test the spirits. So we're there in the footnote. Uh, test the spirits. An appeal for spiritual discernment. Readers must distinguish lying spirits who whisper words of deceit into the ears of the false prophets, 
from the Holy Spirit, whose voice is heard in the teaching of the apostles. As a practical test, John proposes that one's confession of faith, especially in Christ's incarnation, must measure up to the apostolic gospel uh, to be genuine and true. To confess otherwise is to contradict the spirit. Okay, let me just go back to the beginning of that. So <clears throat> testing the spirits, an appeal to spiritual discernment. Uh, again, discern literally means to sort out. You know, if I if I gave you a, a, a you know a bowl of you know small copper coins the size of a penny, you know, and it's like you know there's a hundred coins in there, but inside there is an actual penny. Find it. You start separating, sorting it out in order to find the penny. And so spiritually, the idea is that when he says, "Beloved, do not believe every spirit," first thing that tells us is there's more than one spirit, and uh, and that certainly every spirit, therefore, is not the Holy Spirit. Okay, so beloved, do not believe every spirit. I put a, a little asterisk in my in my workbook, and I added words like also, do not believe every feeling, do not believe every thought, do not believe every emotion, meaning that they all identify what is true. Okay, so for example, I can say, I feel, I feel like nobody cares about me. I feel all alone. Is that a true statement? Did I feel that way? Yes, that's how I feel. Is it true? Nobody cares. I'm all alone. No, it is not. So it's like, that's what I'm feeling, but clearly, but that is not the truth. Because remember, throughout this journey, when Jesus would talk about the, you know, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. So in a sense, so, so many times just practically for us, it's like, well, test that feeling before you go with it. Uh, is that the truth? Uh, I have a thought. This thought just popped in my head. We have lots of thoughts. And it's like, so but it says, don't just go with the thought. Well, I thought it, so I'll do it. Uh, it feels good, so it must be good. It's like, that is not, that doesn't, you know, uh, that's, not the, that's not the case. So you got to test, you got to find out. Um, again, emotions the same way. But to test also means to, in a sense, to verify. You know, so I got to, I have to do, I have to do a little bit of work of examining, which is again, discernment. Now, first of all, what do I measure? You know, so if I'm going to say, is this good? Well, one, one practical thing, uh, I forget the scripture, uh, what Jesus says, you can tell a tree by its fruit. Where does that spirit lead me? Where would that feeling lead me if I went with it? Where would that thought take me? Uh, you know, where would that emotion lead me? Okay, so, um, and, that, so, and, that's, and, so, and that's why part of studying the word of God is becoming familiar with, well, what is God's way? Uh, what's the truth? What did Jesus say about how I treat my neighbor? Um, you know, when uh, how how I react to uh, even evil uh, and uh, or injustice. Um, that uh, um, so I think so. Part of that so that the discern. So when you discern, you need sort of a, what's the word? Um, I forgot. In, in science, you need a. Uh, it'll come to me. Um, basic a standard there's another word a standard to go by you know to to test whether something is authentic or not or the right place so control what's control yes a control uh, uh yes exactly so we you know to say so in a sense it's like and so what the footnote immediately uh points to when it talks so go back to the um the footnote uh test the spirits an appeal for spiritual discernment readers must distinguish lying spirits why do you think it says lying spirits? One of the titles, what's one of the titles again of, of, uh, of the Jesus gives the devil? Father of lies. Uh, there are many, you know, many places in scripture, and even in 1 John, anyone who says, I love my neighbor, I love God and hate my neighbor is a liar. You know, we know that the father of lies, that's what he deals in deception. So I mean, as we said, one of the, what's one, some of the most effective deceiving lies have a grain of truth. There's some truth in it, uh, but it's precisely by having a grain of truth. So, excuse me, one example for, was uh, we read the story of the temptation of Jesus in the desert, where at first, you know, the devil catch, catches on, the devil says something, and Jesus comes back with, it is written. When the last temptation, the devil starts quoting the scripture, Psalm 91 to Jesus. And he says, you know, if the, jump off this ledge, and because the scriptures say, 
you know, that the, the angels will, 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 will guard you, will, will catch you and, and keep your feet from stumbling. And was that scripture true? Actually, it was. But he was misusing it to actually deceive Jesus and lead him astray from his mission. And Jesus responded with another scripture, using it as he always would correctly. Um, so sometimes we can, you know, we can even, you know, we can use scripture to people can use a false prophet. will use scripture to manipulate to actually maybe to get to be served themselves rather than leading them to serve God. Um, but a very, there's a very specific uh, um, barometer to, to judge, you know, to, to discern what is right and what is wrong, especially when it comes to understanding of our faith and God's will. Um, it says, um, back to the footnote, and uh, testing the spirits, an appeal for spiritual discernment. Readers must distinguish lying spirits who whisper words of deceit into the ears of the false prophets from the Holy Spirit, whose voice is heard in the teaching of the apostles. Um, you know, in, uh, let me see, in, in mentioned the scripture there, John 14, uh, teaching the apostles. Yes, uh, John 14, 26. And uh, to quick to read that real quick, John 14, 26 says, uh, this is actually the context, Jesus says, uh, uh, 25, I have told you this while I'm with you. 26, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Um, <clears throat> there's another passage. Um, um, it, it'll come back to me. But, but here, specifically mentioning the Holy Spirit will lead you to the truth of all that I told you. Um, <clears throat> but it's also but here it specifically mentions the apostles. And so looking at the footnote again, as a practical test, John proposes that one's confession of faith, especially in Christ's incarnation, must measure up to the apostolic gospel to be genuine and true. So apostolic, the teaching of the apostles. In our creed, we say we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We have an apostolic church that we believe that, that again, Jesus never wrote any scriptures. Uh, I think we have one account of Jesus writing, and we don't know what he wrote because he knelt down on the ground. The woman was about to be stoned, and it says he started writing something in the ground and never tell us what it was. Uh, but who wrote, you know, again, we have the gospel written you know, by John, uh, by Matthew, by Mark, by Luke, and so the apostles. So what we know of what Jesus taught, we know from the apostles, those who were present. Remember how this, this uh, for the first John, how this um, letter began. In the very beginning first, uh, of John, the first, um, be, uh, at the beginning of the letter of John, before they even start mention, saying their message, uh, remember at the very beginning uh, of John, that you hear them, um, uh, they basically establish their credibility. And so remember, this was the beginning of this letter. Quote, that which was, that which was from the beginning, which we, have heard with our own ears, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we saw it. Again, firsthand witness and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the father and was made manifest to us. That which we have, that which we we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. And we are writing this that our joy may be complete. That's the introduction to this letter, and then it begins the message. This is the message: God is light, and in, in Him there is no darkness. But before they started with the message, they established their credibility. What we're telling you, first of all, we heard Him with our own ears, we saw Him with our own eyes. We touch them with our own hands, and what we and, and we testify what he said. So the apostles are the first hand witnesses of Jesus Christ, and that's why we say when you say apostolic church that the faith we are professing, the teaching that we profess, that we proclaim today, can be traced back to what the apostles, the first hand witnesses, said of Jesus. So that's why. So 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 an uh, authentic. Uh, Authentic, authentication, yes, uh, is you know, to direct to test, is this authentic? Is it consistent with the teaching of apostles? If we're talking about, we're gonna tell you what Christ taught. 
Okay, and that's why, and so we get back to the footnote when it says a practical test, John proposes that one's confession of faith, especially in Christ's incarnation, uh, meaning his, his coming as man, must measure up to the apostolic gospel to be genuine and true. To confess otherwise is to contradict the spirit. Um, and actually, uh, I looked up that too, I think, to contradict the spirit. That was from Corinthians. So I'll just read that uh, there, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Um, it says, uh, let's see, 12, 3. Oops. Yeah. Um, It says, therefore, I tell you that nobody speaking by the spirit of God says, Jesus be accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You probably heard that last line. He says, no one being inspired by the spirit can say Jesus be accursed. The Holy Spirit will never prompt you to do that. Uh, no one who can say Jesus, no one can even say Jesus is Lord sincerely except by the Holy Spirit. So you see the promise and role of the Holy Spirit in discerning spirit. It's like, so Jesus will never, the spirit will never deny Christ. Remember the heart of this issue of the antichrist being anti-Christian, in the sense of, in this letter, again, it's specifically about the claim that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the, all, the hopes of centuries of the Messiah. You know, the, the, the Old Testament prophecies, one day there will be, God will send a Messiah, a savior, a deliverer. And when, remember, we looked at John 4, I mean, sorry, Luke chapter 4, when Jesus says, gets up in the synagogue and it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor, liberty to the captives. And he said, today the scripture passage is fulfilled. So Jesus actually got up and read one of the Old Testament prophecies and said, it's done. I'm here. Uh, I am the anointed one. And so specifically, that is the, so, so he is or he isn't. If you don't believe he is, then there's no savior. Hasn't come yet. We're still kind of lost. We're still in a mess. We're still in trouble because there's no savior yet. But people say, Jesus said, I am the long, uh, the long, um, the long, uh, um, the long awaited Messiah. Okay. The word Christ means, remember, anointed one. Um, he is the anointed one. And uh, those who deny it are called antichrist. The, he's anti-Messiah. He's not the anointed one. He's not the one we're waiting for. That's what he said. If, if anyone says, you know, the Holy Spirit will never move someone to say Jesus is a curse, or Jesus is not Lord, or he's not the Messiah. He's not the deliverer. Uh, he's not the long-awaited one. That means we're still waiting. That there's no Savior yet. Um, and so, uh, and that's, and that was because that, and that was the tension, uh, as we'll see in a second, that, um, that John, even while this letter was written to help them counteract the false prophets, the false, those saying that, no, he's not the Christ. He's not the long awaited one. Um, and that's what, uh, and so if we continue, um, yes, uh, in the footnote, false prophets, um, Many false prophets have gone out into the world. So look what it says about false prophets in the footnotes. Um, false prophets, the heretics who deserted John's community. Uh, yeah, false prophets refer to the heretics who deserted John's community. Both Jesus and the apostles warned of their arrival. So here's again, the scripture passages, Matthew 24, 1 Timothy 4, and 2 Peter talk about those who will, again, uh, will deny, you know, be the false prophets. Um, and remember, and then, yeah, the heretic who deserted John's community. Because remember, it says earlier in this, in this letter how the very people who are, who are attacking Christianity, who are denying it, were people who used to be in the community. Remember, there was, uh, uh, and it says, uh, you know, yes, um, in the previous chapter, chapter two, uh, it says uh, in verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain that they were not of us. As I mentioned, sometimes it's the people who are part of something that break away that often are the biggest critics and often do the most damage. Let me tell you about those people. That's why I left. They were about this or about that. And it's like, you were one of them? Yeah, but I'm not anymore. So often the harshest critics are often the ones that, who, who break away. Um, and so, um, and I wanted to just to kind of hit, to bring this home. Um, 
that that's again a critical theme in this letter about uh, yeah, specifically, uh, I'll read the next footnote to, to, and then uh, refer you to something else. So in verse four, two, by this you know the spirit of God, every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus, Jesus is not of God. Remember again, the issue is, uh, again, his identity as the Christ. I see, uh, I wrote myself a note. Okay, and so look at the footnote four two. Again, come in the flesh. The most serious denial of the false teachers, again, was that Jesus, again, when we celebrate Christmas, God became one of us, they denied. That Jesus was not born of the manger. Jesus did not, was not, is not the Messiah. He didn't, God did not become human. Okay, the most serious denial of the false teachers. John makes several emphatic assertions about the physical reality of Jesus, humanity, to counter this rejection. Okay, denial of the incarnation of Christ took many forms in Christian antiquity. You see introduction to 1 John. I actually want to do that. Um, it's page 13 and 14. So in the introduction to this book, it it, it tells, it shared with us, I just want to, I, I, on our first day covering this book, we, we mentioned this, but in, in the introduction to this, um, to letter John and to this workbook, it talks about the purpose. Why is John writing this letter? And just as a reminder, so it mentions this, the purpose, the letter, this letter aims to strengthen believers. Believers who are threatened by a heretical group that broke away from their community. Okay. These individuals whom John calls antichrists, liars, deceivers, false prophets, deny that Jesus was the Christ and the son of God. Um, that Jesus was the one who would who fulfill the expectations of the Messiah. And it says, uh, and that he who had, had truly come in the flesh. Attempts have been made to identify these apostates, those who again abandoned the faith, with various heretical with various heretical groups that cropped up in the second century. So this again, so again, so this is not this, there were real groups in the second century, the time of, the, of John's writing, um, and so uh, such as uh, the Docetists. Uh, again, a group you can look up is a real group. Docetists, hey, they denied the reality of Christ's humanity. They didn't believe that God became human. Uh, that or well, that Jesus became he was human, uh, you know the Gnostics who had deep aversion to the physical and material element of man. In that case, see, the Gnostics one that said the idea that God would even become human is quite absurd to us because they they just saw the body, the physical is is evil, it's corrupt, you know, it's impure. God would never take that on. It's like God taking taking off a you know a king's robe and putting on filthy clothes. It's like so they just the idea that. Because that's also how they saw themselves. The thing that's what makes you holy, what's 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 a uh, value to you, is not your body; it's your spirit. You know, so the body, you know, you can uh, is, is of, no, of no use. So God wouldn't take on a body. That's what the Gnostics said, believe, um, and uh, or the uh, uh, um, Corinthians, uh, C E R I N T H I A N S. Think of Corinthians. No, the Corinthians. They claim, so these are groups that in John's time, who, when he wrote this letter, uh, uh, the, the Corinthians who claim that the divine person of Christ descended uh, from, the divine person of Christ descended on the man Jesus at his baptism, but withdrew from him before the passion. What is that about? Well, think about it. It's like, again, this idea that God was stooped so low. See, the idea you have, you, you say, we started today with um, Isaiah before God, holy, 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 thrice holy God. He's so holy. He's so powerful. He's so great. And the idea of becoming a human, that God, can a God so great be that humble? Go that low? Did he take on the flesh, you know, from, from, from Mary? Uh, and the most absurd of all, that he would be cru let himself be crucified? die a violent, horrific death. People, it's like, it was like too much. God, we cannot imagine God would ever go that low. Um, that a God so great, so, so certainly would not be that humble. Um, and so, so they figured, so with the, this particular heretical group called the Corinthians, they claim that the, the divine person of Christ descended upon the man Jesus at his baptism. Like the Holy Spirit came upon him, 
and exited before the passion. Because again, the divine son of God would God would not let himself experience crucifixion. Okay. Um, so whatever the point is this, why did John write this letter to this to this disbelieving community, the Christian community? Whatever the, as a, as a foot commentary says, whatever the background of these opponents of all these I mentioned, you know, the, the Gnostics, the Docetists, the Corinthians, uh, whatever the background of these opponents opponents, John wanted to expose their propaganda as contrary to the apostolic faith handed down since the beginning. That is the point. He wanted to just, you know, just again that to point out how what they're saying is absolutely uh, um, uh, not consistent with the apostolic faith, with the faith and the teachings of Christ that came from the apostles. Okay, so that's, um, and that's why again, so often it's in that context, but I'm primarily, even when we talk about antichrist, anti-Messiah, denying that Jesus is the long for savior. Okay. Um, yes, and so that's, uh, so again, verse three, um, you know, before verse two, it said, you know, every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God. Again, again, um, a mentality hostile to the messianic dignity of Jesus. Okay. So then it says, this is a spirit. Uh, yeah, this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you heard that it was coming. And now uh, it is in the world already. Okay, um, I actually made myself a note to look up Luke 11, 14. So let me just see what that says. Luke, let's see. Luke 11, 14. Yeah, um, just make sure. Then 14, yeah, I, actually this is a good example from the gospel. So. We were talking about, again, those who deny that Jesus is the long-form Messiah. Remember the story from the gospel? Uh, Luke 11, 14. I'll read it. You'll probably be familiar with some of you. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute person spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, it's by the power of Beelzebul, you know, the, uh, the prince of demons. Uh, that he drives out demons. Now think about that. Jesus, who is the Son of God, Jesus, who is holy, God's representative on earth, they say, no, he's not. He's just the opposite. He is actually doing the devil's work. That's what they say. It's like, talk about antichrist. It's like they're literally saying he's the opposite. He's actually not the God's you know, Christ, uh, um, you know, God's anointed one. He's actually doing the work of the devil. Uh, by the power of the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Others, to test him, asked him for a sign from heaven. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste, and house will fall against house. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will this kingdom stand? But you say that it is by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that I drive out demons. If I then drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your own people drive them out? Therefore, that, therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God is upon you. It's like you decide. Is this working through the power of God? Is the anointing one? Or the power of demons? If it is if I drive out, uh, but therefore, uh, yeah, but if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons and the kingdom of God is upon you. Okay. Um, so that, so, so here you see, even before John in the gospel itself, this is the gospel of Luke chapter 11, where the people were accusing Jesus of being not only not the Messiah, but the opposite of the Messiah. But think about, you know, but what are the consequences of that? Um, think about it. If, if you were in a boat that capsized and, you know, a Coast Guard, you know, cutter is right, is, is, is in the vicinity, they come, uh, come for you and you're struggling to stay afloat. And for whatever reason, when you see that cutter, Coast Guard cutter coming towards you, and maybe it's dark and it's a light and you are terrified, you actually believe they're coming to roll over you, to kill you. What's your reaction? 
you're going to fight the fight to get as far away from it as you can. You, you're literally thinking it's the opposite. It's the rescue boat, but you think it's the opposite. It's evil. It has, you know, uh, deadly motives. And in the end, you drowned because you fled. It's kind of interesting. You can tread water for so long. So the truth is they were coming to rescue you. But what if you had the opposite idea? You would literally be fleeing from your rescuer. Or I can use another word, savior, deliverer, messiah. Okay, so that's why this is, that, that's what's at stake. In a sense, you know, so the idea is to remember this began with beloved, don't believe every spirit, test the spirit. And the specific test that he's mentioning here is ultimately, is it a spirit that lifts up Christ, that acknowledges who he is, that, uh, that honors that name? Remember earlier we read, no one can say Jesus is Lord, sincerely, except by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit cannot deny Jesus. The Holy Spirit cannot, uh, can only, will only lift up Jesus. Okay, um, so maybe practically again, um, as you're discerning, um, you know, it, sometimes a very simple thing, uh, and I've mentioned this before, um, you know, there's a popular acronym back in the 80s and 90s, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Um, but I often encourage people to think, to ask themselves the question, what would please God? Meaning, honestly, let's say I have a decision to make, what should I do? Genuinely, what do you sincerely believe would please God? Um, what comes to mind out of the options in front of you, okay? And it's like, because sometimes you may say, well, and I've heard this, like, well, I, I know, I'm sure God would want me to do, this, do, to do this, but dot, dot, dot. But this is really scary, uh, but fill in the blanks. Uh, but, um, you know, it would be really inconvenient and my life's gonna be hard and I won't have the support and, but you know, it's kind of like, but you acknowledge, Honestly, I believe God would want me to do X. I think Christ would want me to do X. So when I say, but I'm not going to do it, without it, I'm essentially saying, I'm denying he's the Christ. He's the rescuer. He's the savior. He's the good shepherd. A good shepherd not it protects you. A good shepherd guides you the right way. A good shepherd equips you, feeds you. So when I sin and I turn away, I'm actually, my behavior is saying he's not the savior. He's not the one to deliver me. And therefore I'm looking to someone because, and maybe because I'm afraid. Okay. Um, and so, you know, that, that's what, so, so it's important to, when you're like, I'm really scared. I'm gonna do this. Okay. Wait a minute. It says, don't believe every spirit. And that's why I added those others to maybe make it more practical for us. Don't go with every feeling. Don't believe every thought. Don't believe every emotion. Go, it's like, you got to stop and say, is where does this go? And I'm saying, Jesus said, you can tell the truth by its fruit. Specifically the fruit that, 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 that what this, what John is pointing out is, is it something that's going to honor Christ or not? Is it something going to be consistent with what he taught or not? So that's, he says, test it, you know? And then ultimately saying, trust. When you conclude that where I was thinking of going, maybe because my fears, I, want, I was thinking of going because I was afraid or it's going to be convenient or it's going to be the easier road. I, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, do I, do I tell the truth about something? Do I uh, admit I was at fault at this? If I, you know, and it's like, uh, well, yeah, there are consequences, but, or do I lie? Remember, a father who art in heaven, the father of lies. Who's your daddy? It's like, who, which father am I going to represent now? Um, and uh, so, and that, so those are, the, so that's why as the more familiar you get with the word of God, the more you equip to, uh, I know what his will is. I know what he want. And even sometimes I said, when I don't, when I said, uh, what would please God? If you ask that question before any, like say big decision you had to make, is it a guarantee you're going to, the, what you choose is going to be God's will? I'd say no, because we don't have perfect knowledge. So it may be possible. You may say like a year later, like, you know what, if I knew now, if I knew then what I know now, I'm sure I would have made a different decision. But the question is, a year ago, when you made that decision, I said, well, what would please God? I thought it was this, sincerely. Uh, 
even if in somehow in the end you discover that that maybe was not the better choice, you still God is still pleased because He know why you made the choice. If you just sincerely like, I I truly want to please God. Uh, I think most of the time we're actually going to get it right because again, what I expect more and more within myself or certainly as a, as ministering for over thirty one years for oh, thirty one years, people often deep down know what the right thing is. It's like should I, you know, should I? Uh, terminate this pregnancy or not? If they ask, well, what do I sincerely believe would please God? You know, I, I've never heard this like, I think, you know, terminating pregnancy, that, that would be the most pleasing to God. And that's why I'm doing it. I simply want to please him. So think about that. If you apply to anything, you know, any big decision, any dilemma, if, you, if you're honest with yourself, what do I genuinely, now, the reason I say, yeah, I think this would be pleasing God. However, I'm afraid of what that would mean. And maybe, you know, and, and just what, and, and often fear is, is what it takes to lead. Okay. And sometimes people are terrified. Okay. So it's not just, you know, oh, you're just unfaithful. It is, it's like, but I've lost faith. And I'm like, I'm just afraid. I'm, I'm afraid maybe he won't be a good shepherd. He, maybe he won't take care of me if I do what he wants. You know, maybe he won't have my back. Maybe I'll get rejected by the by people and I'll be out there all alone. And you know who's feeding all of those thoughts? The father of lies. Because he's a very good liar and a very good deceiver. I mean, good, I mean, that good isn't good, but effective. He's clever. And I start feeding on those fears and those worst case scenarios. And suddenly before you know it, I'm off. Make a decision that I didn't believe was pleasing God. It's like, so that's what it says, you know, test, verify, be, you know, be thoughtful. It's like, so, and by the way, sometimes it's like, I'm still kind of dilemma. I'm really, I'm thinking, I'm, it's like, this is my advice when I was seeking God's will. You know, four quick things. Um, uh, if you are not praying, then you, you, you need to start praying, you know, seeking God out. Uh, if I'm not praying, I'm not in a place to, to, to find God's will cl with clarity, unless there's something obvious. Should I, should I kill this person or not? <laughs> it's like, clearly that, that's an easy one um, as far as pleasing God. Uh, but it's like, so if I'm not praying, you need to start. I need to start giving, giving God my ear, my listening ear. I need to stop. I don't have time to pray. I'm so busy. You need to stop because you got a big decision in front of you. Even What did Jesus do before he picked his disciples? This is what the scripture says Jesus did. He prayed, not just he got up early and prayed. No, it says he prayed all night. All night he was in prayer. Next day, he picked, the, he picked his disciples. But it's like, this is a big decision. This is the future of the church. He, 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 he spent time the whole night with God. So if I really want to know what God wants, give, sit with God. Listen. Okay, second, related, scripture. Can read the scriptures. You have a favorite psalm? Read it. I mean, it, God will, anytime you open a scripture to read something, eventually you find yourself in a whole other section for, for different reasons, that, that, that something led you. So you, the Holy Spirit will lead you. And so you need to, if you, see, if you sincerely want to know what God wants. And I say that because, you know, sometimes people don't, know, don't want to know what God wants. It's like, what does God want to do with my life? I'm not sure I want to know because I might not like it. What if it's something different than what I want? So at that point, but again, what that reveals is a lack of knowledge of God, a lack of love of God, a lack of trust in God. You clearly, and I said, none of us knows God perfectly, anywhere close to it. I clearly don't know God well if I'm concluding, I can't trust him. And you know that somehow God may have will for me, maybe something that is just going to be, uh, you know, something that's only going to, uh, uh, it, will never, it will never lead me to peace and never lead me to joy. That's just a person talking who doesn't know God well, okay? Because God can't, you know, do anything that is, that because God is truth and God is love and God, you know, cannot do anything that's not for my, for my best. God can't. Um, the Father in heaven. The Father of lies, whole different story, okay? His, his goal is your leading you away from God, leading you away from peace, leading you away from from others to isolation where you really are alone and in the dark.
and losing hope, to lead you away from hope. That's the father of lies. So uh, as I mentioned, so four things I said, you know, if you're not praying, you need to start praying. And if you're not, and we'll have to say, you know, I stopped going to church. You know, I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking about COVID. I kind of, you know, I used to go every Sunday and then it was like every, you know, every two weeks and then once a month, it's like, you know what? I need to come back because I, you know, I've been doing this as a priest, uh, a pastor for so long. I've had more people than I can count who says, Father Pat, I, it's you were talking to me in today's sermon. I mean, you must read minds. And I tell them, I don't read minds, but I know someone who does. And clearly, he had a word to you. He, he spoke to you. People said, I'm glad I came. I'm, I'm glad I heard. I came to hear what he said. So it's like, so God, you know, so and part of it's like what I know is right. Um, Mother Teresa put it this way. I think a, a priest asked her, um, you know, what, um, what is the question? I forgot the question he asked her. I think of just um, wanting to walk in God's will. And she gave a really simple and yet amazingly profound answer. She says, okay, first, um, how does she put it? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I can't remember. I've known this in my heart for so long. Um, the first thing was, I never remember the last thing, but the first thing was, yeah, yeah. She simply said for him, it's like, uh, every day spend an hour before the blessed sacrament. So prayer. And then the second thing was much more practical. And two, never do anything you know is wrong. So I, when I, I don't, because again, I don't, when I translate that to, to your average person, it's not, not everybody necessarily has the opportunity to spend an hour for a blessed sacrament, but prayer. You know, and so it's like, you know, um, pray every pray every day. And the second answer is the same. Never do anything you know is wrong. I'm not saying, well, I didn't really know it was wrong or not. I was unclear. No, there's some things I absolutely know. Uh, and yet I'm very tempted to do. So that idea, if you're going to, if I consciously, that's what would sin, I choose to take a distance from God. Remember early on the part that kind of uh, of the scripture in chapter three that made us nervous because it's saying, you know, um, uh, you know, any person, you know, a person who is begotten of God cannot sin. And we're like, oh my gosh, does that, am I not a child of God? No, the real question is, am I acting like a child of God? Because it said a child of God by, I'm a child of God by grace, which means, and again, by adoption by the Holy Spirit. So the point is, the Holy Spirit is never going to lead you to sin, ever, ever. There's, not, there's no exception because he's holy and he's in you. And he says, follow my lead. We can grieve the Holy Spirit when we go against. We can, you know, reject the Holy Spirit. But, said, but if I am living as a child of God, remember, as a, I am a child of my parents. And that's a given. That's natural. You know, natural, natural generation. Again, as a, natural, as, as a child of two parents who were also imperfect and sinners, sinning is not something that's going to be out, out of the question. Well, you know, I've had simple parents. Uh, they were imperfect parents. But specifically as a child of God, it's like living and ch choosing to live under the influence of, under the guidance of, following of the Holy Spirit. When I do that, I do not sin. And none of you do when you do that, okay? But remember, out of all of God's creation, we're the only part of God's creation that has a choice. I can choose for this moment, I'm gonna step out of my identity as child of God and I'm gonna start just acting like a child of my parents. Well, I'm simply gonna do what I wanna do. And the Holy Spirit is not moving me to, to remember, the Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. A sign of, of the spirit of evil is it will not honor Jesus. So I'm like, I know Jesus wants me to do this, but I'm going to go do that. It is not the Holy Spirit that's leading me to do that. It's me right now putting a hold on my child of God identity. And now rather than living under God's influence, the Holy Spirit's influence, I'm going to simply go with this urge, this desire, this thought this spirit that really is not consistent with the spirit of Christ and the spirit of holiness. So, so part of, remember in a couple of sessions ago that ultimately the more we get to know God, it's, it's really that we're never, we're not living a Christian life. I think it was in a sermon that uh, asked for the grace to fall in love with him. Cause you know what? It's never, when you are absolutely in love with somebody, is it hard to do serve them? Not at all. It's a joy to, 
you know, it's not hard. It's, it's the opposite. I want to, it's, if someone has, you know, saved your life, it's like, you know, and they're like, can you do me a little favor? You're like, nah, I'm busy. No, that's not what you say. You saved my life. You know, you, you know, you, you cared when no one else cared. You know, you came to me when no one else would. You believed in me when everyone given up on me. You know, you, you know, and, and it's like, I am grateful. Let me, what can I do for you? You know, that again, when you, and it's like you, 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 it's a joy. And so sometimes it's like part of it is getting to know him better because, you know, if, if we, when we don't, it, it is the, the, what he asks of us. Because sometimes it will be hard, it will be scary. Come, take, go out of my comfort zone. Um, you know, uh, I can remember. Uh, yeah, I, I remember. I was uh, had we had a first Friday mass. I had an altar server, probably I don't know, maybe ninth grade, next to me, and it was nobody to do the first reading. And I said, "Hey, you want to do a reading?" He's like, "What?" I says, "A reading. You're a good reader." And it's like, a, so he went up and did the reading. Totally on the spot. I know I was nervous, and I but I knew he could do it. And it's like you know, and I, I right before mass started, and so I, I I showed it to them, and they're like, okay, you can do it, fine. And they did it fine, but they were so nervous. But you know what? One, he could have said, uh, no, no, Father, no, nah, I can't do it. Nah, I'm not gonna. But something moved him. He this, this is not comfortable. But somehow I'm in church. I'm an altar server. And Father needs me to read the scriptures. What would please God? I think that's the question he asked. And there was no way he was going to conclude, uh, I think God would be most pleased if I do not proclaim his word. That didn't mean he wasn't scared. That means he wasn't thinking, Father, never do that to me again, please. But he did it. And he did a good job. And it's like, but I know it wasn't, it, it was like, he knew there was no way he could convince himself God doesn't want me to do it. So he did it, but it meant he had to go out of his comfort zone and face his fear. And, uh, but he trusted. And that's what I told him, I said, you know, God's with you. I said, remember, people get nervous when they focus on themselves. You know, am I going to mess it up? Are these people all staring at me? Me, 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 I, I, I. It's like, I said, no that God simply wants to use your voice to proclaim his word that's going to touch somebody's heart. Will you let him use it just for this time? He couldn't say no. Um, he could have said no and correct that as a human being, but he knew it was right. And, uh, it seems, and, and, and sure enough, God had his back. God let he got through it. And, you know, he's still alive today to talk. Okay, uh, it didn't kill him. Uh, but that's uh, but the thought was again, it, it, it meant again discerning what is the right thing. In that case, it, it was it was not hard to discern. But see what happens is we can discern what's the right thing. But because if we don't trust God and don't know God well, our fears can still take over, and they say I, I'm I'm just too scared. I, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and because ultimately I don't know, it, will God have my back? Will God leave me hanging? Will I just be out there? feeling like a complete fool because I messed it all up and all these people are thinking, you know, who is this kid? Why is he in church? <laughs> you know, all those things, in imagination that would have sh and that, that shuts you down. And I think that's part of what discerning when you have a thought, I really think that is the right thing. But then all these other avalanche of thoughts come and you listen to them and listen to them and end up not doing it. That's a clear sign. That's deception. Because I was, you know, you are ready to go to mass on Sunday or Saturday night. You know, I'm going to get up and set my clock. I'm going to go to church. Next morning, you're like, I'm tired. I'm, uh, you know, I think I'm just going to sleep in. And here's a question you have to ask yourself. Who was it? What spirit was moving me Saturday night that was enthusiastic about going to mass and receiving Jesus Christ in the Eucharist? And the next day, what talked you out of it? What thoughts came to your mind that, ah, no, I'll pass. Well, here's the thing. I can promise you this. The spirit moving you Saturday night and the spirit coaxing you Sunday morning were not the same. 
they were not the same. And you can tell because the direction was opposite. Okay. And it's like, what would please God was what motivated you Saturday night? And, and somehow that question didn't even come up on Sunday. I just don't feel like it. You know, my feelings, my thoughts, my emotions, uh, test the spirits, he says. Don't believe every thought, every idea, every emotion, every feeling, and believe that must be the truth. I said, God, you know, you inspired, you inspired to go to Mass on Saturday. You were inspired not to on Sunday, meaning a spirit convinced you not to go. And I'm telling you, they went, again, both could not be God. I say it all the time, you know, while God is omnipresent, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, present everywhere, but the Holy Spirit is not schizophrenic. The Holy Spirit is not confused. Okay, go to mass, you know, go, go to, you know, uh, go to mass. And, oh, uh, you know what? Nah, you don't have to, I I'm not really sure. Maybe uh, I I'm confused. I'm God and I'm confused. I figure it out yourself. That is not God. And deep down, you know it. There was a spirit saying, go to confession. Oh, no. Do I have to do that? I haven't done that in 10 years or 20. Why not? Not because you don't think you're a sinner. Not because, you know, I say, well, I just, you know, and you, yeah, those common things, you know, well, you know, I just go to God. I don't need to, it's like, well, first of all, Jesus actually told the apostles, he gave them the power to forgive sins. I can't think of any example in scripture where God gave power to anybody to do something that he never intended them to do. James 5 says, confess your sins to one another. Okay. But the idea that, you know, and that, remember we said here when it said those who, uh, uh, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see actually later on. I think those who, uh, um, we'll see later, it, says, it talks about sinning and how, that some sin is venial, some, some sin is deadly, some sin is not. But the point is not to get off track. But I did, we have the thought, you know, I should go to mass tomorrow. I should visit grandma tomorrow. I should give a call to my friend that I know was kind of having a little down last time and it just, they just popped in my head and I thought I have time, but you know what, but I really could do this. If I start studying Bible study early, you know, maybe I'll be more prepared. And so I'm going to do that. But where did that thought come from to call my friend who's been having a rough time? The devil? Did the devil want me to encourage her? Of course not. So don't be so quick to dismiss your thoughts because your thoughts are one of the ways, a key way that God does speak to you. The Holy Spirit guides you. Again, test every thought to make sure if it's leading to a way that, that's clear, that, that says, nah, that's not, I don't think that's what God is pleasing to God. Um, but if, but there are many thoughts, how many, so there are many times we don't realize it, that even on a daily basis, we out and out tell God, no, but that's not how we interpret our own head. I just rejected that thought. Well, I had this thought, and I said, oh, no, I'll do it later. You know, I mean, how many people once in a while, you know, I had a funeral today, but how many times I've met people who are like, I feel so horrible. I was thinking about, you know, my cousin. One day, she was so vivid in my mind. I thought, oh, I need to call, I need to visit. I need to, you know, I need to give her a call. And I never did it. And a week later, I heard she died. I feel horrible. And many times that's that sobering moment. It's kind of like, I, won't, I, won't, I don't want to ever do that again. So for some reason, for no reason, this person's coming to mind to give a call. I'm going to call because you know what? It isn't for no reason that they came to your mind. It can very actually be they were praying that someone might call them. Or they were thinking to self that nobody cares. And God, sometimes I'm really struggling because, you know, I'm here alone and no one's called me and I just wish somebody would. And you didn't know it, but that thought came to your mind was an answer to that person's prayer. The, the answer was you, but you didn't realize it. And so instead of doing what he prompted you to do, you just let it go. And that person is actually thinking God doesn't answer prayer. God doesn't care. The truth is, God does answer prayer and God does care. The problem in that moment was that you didn't answer God. And maybe you didn't care as much as God did. It's like, so trust, you are important in the kingdom of God. You, you are God, you are, your role in God's kingdom is far bigger than you even would ever imagine. You, you can't think I'm not important, but you are. 
So Moses thought, oh, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know how to talk. And Isaiah said, I'm a sinful person. And, 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 you know, and, and Jeremiah said, I'm too young. And Abraham said, I'm just too old. Peter said, I'm a foolish man. God would never use me. Oh, they were all wrong. And that's why we know all of their names. Because despite their assessment of themselves and their worthiness, God called them. And God used them and worked through them to impact people's lives and they're still impacting them today, even though they, they have not walked this earth. So again, that's, do not underestimate. I mean, God, think about it. Maybe one of the great mysteries is a God who is all holy. He works through sinners. See, we're constantly asking ourselves, what am I worthy? Well, let me save you the suspense. No, none of us are worthy. That has nothing to do. You know, is an infant worthy? What have they done? Have they earned a mother's love? No. So why does she love them so? Because that's her it. That's her child. That's it. It's not earned. God is love, as we'll see in a second, as, as, we, as we'll see, we read in a second. You know, God is love. So it's not something earned. So are you worthy? No, but that wasn't a requirement. The real question is, not are you worthy, are you willing? Are you willing to come when he says come? Are you willing to go where he says to go? Are you willing to do what he tells you to do? Are you willing to say what he tells you to say? Are you willing to zip it when he tells you to zip it? Don't say anything. Um, are you willing to help when he tells you to help? Are you willing to feed the hungry and clothe the naked? Are you willing to pray, come to him in prayer? Are you willing to worship him even when you don't feel great? Are you willing to open your mouth and praise, even though you just want to keep it and, hold, and, 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 and sit in grief? You know, all these things. So am I willing to follow him? So, um, so again, testing the spirit. Part of that, and I say maybe, again, practically for us, examine your thoughts. Because your thoughts, you, you go where your mind takes you. So start to examine. Before I just have a thought and go with it, wait a minute. Have I tested it? Time out. Because the scripture said, don't believe every spirit. Don't believe every thought just because you have it. That's the thing to do. No. Don't relieve every feeling. Well, I felt like doing this. Said, yeah, but is that the good thing? Is that the right thing? Any parents on this call, you know this. Because you had this discussion with your four-year-old. You know, I wanted to do this. I want to do that. Well, you know, I want to eat this. Can I have a donut? You no, know, dinner's in 10 minutes. But can I have a donut? No, but I want a donut. And if you're being honest, I really want it. I feel like it. I think about it. You know, so, yeah, but guess what? No, that's not, that's not, that's not God. That's not the truth speaking. That's just your belly speaking. That donut. Okay, so again, so it's, it's, it's again, it's, 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 it's simple and yet, and, 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 uh, and it says common sense and sense, but it's also just very profound important that, and again, the key thing is I mentioned example of the Saturday night, oh, I'm going to church, Sunday night, no, nah, I'm not gonna bother. You gotta examine, again, think about, wait a minute, two different, totally opposite. And it, it and so guess what? It couldn't have been the Holy Spirit. You know, it, it, it's, it's clearly not the same spirit. So having the ability to, the importance to pay attention to where are my thoughts taking me? Where is this, you know, Called, called inspiration taking me of the of the spirit is it is a god spirit okay so again i just made it very practical the context here is about does it glorify christ and honor him as messiah and redeemer and savior or does it deny it remember when jesus even healed people they said oh it's by the prince of demons they denied they're like no we're not going to we're not going to give we're not going to give god credit for this the other passages where jesus healed somebody and the scripture said and the people glorified God for giving such authority to human beings. He cast out a demon. They said, wow, God did something amazing through him. They, they knew that was the spirit of God working through him. And here in this example, I gave the example I gave you, they literally uh, described his doing the work of God. And they actually literally credited the evil one. Okay, so... Um, we don't want to give credit to the evil one's direction and, and assume that that's the truth. The truth makes us free. The lies do just the opposite. Um, 
paralyze us, get, paralyze us, get us stuck in our shame and in our guilt. And then lies go further. Well, come for forgiveness. Go to confession. No, nah, I don't want to do that. Again, the devil's always trying to convince you not to come closer to God. You know, don't go to church. You don't have time to pray. Don't, you know, as you know, uh, someone says, you know, that, you know, we need a catechist for the teach second grade. It's kind of like, you can, I can fully do it, but I don't have time. But maybe I really do have time. But I, I thought of doing it because, you know, maybe I could learn more about my faith. And I really thought of it, thought of it. And in the end, I said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. And you never actually just tested the spirit. Like, wait a minute. I was thinking, yes, yes, yes. And suddenly, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. And I never asked myself, where did that second thought come from? Well, let me say it more poignantly. Who did that second thought come from? Again, one was God, because you could tell by food. Where was it leading me? I'm te teaching the faith to those second graders. And that's what I'm called to do is share the faith. But I'm actually, because I, I my pride won't let me sit in front of even second graders and make a fool of myself because I don't know what I'm talking about. So I actually started working that lesson plan and studying that textbook, and I learned something. I'm not going to tell anybody that I didn't know this because the second grade work. But, oh, those are the spiritual works of mercy. Those are corporate works of mercy. And why did you learn it? And why do you, you know it well? Because you had to teach it to them. See, the whole time God was trying to bring you closer as well as bring those kids closer. So always think about when you have that thought of doing good, especially in doing God's work, maybe like that altar server. You no, know, will you read this reading? They were nervous, but they're like, I have to do it. And they did. And we were edified by it. Okay. Um, so it continues. I know we have about 10 minutes left, but let's uh, look back at the four. Um, let's look again at verse, um, yeah, verse four uh, of chapter four. Little children, you are of God. And overcome them, referring to the Antichrist, those who reject Jesus as the Christ. You've overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You know what the Antichrist says? The spirit of the Antichrist? No, he's not. You see the forces of darkness, violence, everything. It's just overwhelming. What difference can I make? What difference can Christ make in me or through me? He's not greater. He said, oh no, the truth is, yes, he is. And he's also, the thing that's, the good news also that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That also includes me. He's greater than me. And he's stronger than me. And he's holier than me. And he can help me. And he can deliver me. You know, I can lean on him. His arms are strong enough. He can carry me. Even if I walk through the valley of darkness, shadow of death, I don't have to be afraid because he's with me. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So speak to him. Start your day. Uh, lean on him. Talk to him. Uh, and so look at the footnote on that passage, particular verse, 4-4. Four, four. He who is in you, the indwelling spirit who empowers us to resist deception by the strength of the truth. So that's interesting, not just empowers us, but strengthens us to resist deception. And also not just empowers us, but because the spirit of truth enlightens us. Look this, at this more closely, discern and recognize what's really going on. Recognize, oh, uh, I think I'm being deceived. I think you're trying to con me. I think you're trying to lure me away. But what really matters, I caught you, I see it. No, I'm not falling for it. The Holy Spirit will give you insight, wisdom. He is the spirit of wisdom. I mean, boy, you can't get, if you go to the source of wisdom. There's no better source. There's no, to, to, to find, you know, to Lord, give me, you know, the, again, wisdom to guide me. Okay, so again, uh, the one who empowers you, uh, the, whole, the indwelling spirit, empowers us to resist deception by the strength of truth. This is one way believers share in Christ's victory over the devil, who still holds the unbelieving world captive in ignorance and error. This is one way believers share in Christ's victory over the devil, the father of lies, who still holds the unbelieving world captive in ignorance and error. You know, captive in ignorance, ignorance and lack of knowledge. They don't know. I don't know Christ. I don't know his gospel. I don't know his truth. Or simply in error, 
again, that I embrace something that, that is not true. You know, it's, um, uh, you know, we can be, as we talked about last Sunday, you know, we can even be passionate. Like Saul was passionate about persecuting the church. He thought he was doing God's work. He was totally in error. And God himself, Christ himself had to point it out. Why are you, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's like, I had no idea. But he enlightened him. Remember, as I said, people say that the, the light, God, God blinded him with the light. No, no, no. God did not blind Saul with the light. God is not in the blinding business. God enlightens. God cures the blind. God gives us sight. Uh, so what happened to Saul? When he that flash of lightning fell off the horse, God did not, the light did not blind Saul. The light revealed Saul's blindness. He didn't know he was blind until the light realized the truth. You got it all wrong, Saul. Okay. Um, so again, greater is he than, uh, than uh, in, in us than he is in the world. Um, and this again, it continues, they, they are of the world, those who reject Jesus as Messiah, Antichrist. Therefore, what they say is of the world and the world listens to them. Um, and he who is not of God does not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we are of God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Those who know God will listen to us who are teaching the truth and speaking the truth. They know God. Oh, please God. Yes, that sounds right, what you're saying. That's consistent. And he who is not of God does not listen to us. I'd even clarify, not clarify, but to add a, a commentary on that. He who is not of God, okay, says does not listen to us. Sometimes it's even Further, he who is not of God can't hear us. Just can't hear you. Um, it's like you know when you look at you know as I said, you know, we, um, if you think about how you know you hear like well the church has been desecrated or uh, it's kind of like you know because like you are the enemy, you know you are hateful, you know uh, if 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 you if you challenge people who are living contrary to the truth of God it's kind of like you hate us. It's like, it's like no, I don't hate you. Um, you know, so whether, you know, um, and some people say, like, they live it. I can't hear you. Because, you know, their perception is, let's say, if you, if you uh, uh, reject uh, uh, abortion, that you're my enemy. Um, if you uh, affirm, you know, God's plan for, for human sexuality, you know, you're my enemy. Okay. And it's like, no, no, we're not. I'm not. Uh, but, you know, it's like whoever is, you know, if, if a person, if, 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 if they're coming from a sense of simply, this is what I want, this is my right, not necessarily related to what I, be, what I really believe God, I'm simply seeking to please God, it's like many times I say they can't even hear what you're saying because they've already interpreted it as you're the enemy, you're, you're in opposition, you're against me. Um, and so, and that's why, again, we even taken the time to, uh, uh, to, un to, to grow closer to God, to hear his word, to trust him. Because uh, it's got to challenge us too, because sometimes we're the ones that need to be enlightened. Um, we're the ones in ignorant who are more likely to simply hear the world out and go that direction until we are enlightened and realize that actually God's truth is the way. That's the way to be free. Um, and so as he mentions, the one way believers share in Christ's victory over the devil, um, uh, the devil who still holds the unbelieving world captive in ignorance, lack of knowledge, and just error. Um, the father of lies. He says, he says, listen to us. He said, listen to us, he says, is the apostles. The teaching of Christ that we receive from the apostles. Okay. Um, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Um, so when I also say that, sometimes says people, it says uh, those who are of the world can't uh, uh, whoever knows God, listen to us, and he who does not know God does not listen to us. It's not just so I mentioned like cannot hear, but let's say even like cannot accept God's authority. For example, to say that if God is my creator, then that means God is the author of my life. Is that okay with you? It's like, can you accept that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I believe God created. God is the author. Okay, so if he's the author, he has authority to tell me who I am to have a plan for my life that he didn't consult me beforehand. 
He can tell me who I am. He can tell me what's right and wrong. Remember the story with the Adam and Eve when they eat of the tree. With the one tree in the garden they weren't supposed to eat from, it says the tree of, of the, uh, the middle garden, the tree of, of good and evil. And someone will say, well, why does the, why would God not want them to, the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? But why would God not want Adam and Eve to have the knowledge of good and evil? Well, it's the wrong question. Of course God wants you to have knowledge of good and evil. He just doesn't want you to think that you define good and evil. You know, I will decide what is good and evil. He says, no, that's God's job. And God can be trusted. God is the all-wise one. God is the author of my life. So he's, he has authority to guide me, to tell me. But if I but but if I don't acknowledge accept that, then it's like, well, no, I'm gonna make it up. I'm gonna be author of my life. I am who I say I am. There's a song out that says, you know, uh, uh, I am who, who he says I am. It's a song called If He Said It, If He Said It, We Believe It. Disciples, if he said it, we believe it. But one of my refrains is, I am who he says I am. I am who he says I am. I trust God authority. I trust God more than I trust myself. And so many people are like, what is the, the big question today? Identity. Who am I? I'm searching. I got to find it. But that's what I said. If you want to know the purpose of the thing, don't ask the thing. Ask the author. If you acknowledge. So it's one thing like acknowledging. Do you acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah? Do you acknowledge that he has all authority? He said, all authority is given to me. And now I send you. Go make disciples. Do I accept the authority of his word? Do I simply accept the authority of God? God's the author. So, so many people are confused about and searching desperately even, and I have compassion for them. Who am I? What I am? You know, what am I? I feel I'm this way. Test that spirit. Is it consistent with God's word? You know, and it gets, it really gets down to very practical. So when God says, you know, I, he created us in his, first of all, this privileged thing. He created us in his image and likeness. God made us like himself. And he says, I made a male and female in my image, you know, like me. We're like, well, I don't know. I, I, I disagree. I feel different. I, I have, I think different. Um, you know, I, uh, that, that soul is like, soul? Yep, I got a decision to make. Who has the authority? Who is the author? Will I choose to author myself or acknowledge that he is the author of my life? And as we will read about starting with verse seven next week, this one who's the author of my life, this one who has plan made plans for my life without consulting me, this one who defines who I am and my purpose, is one other thing. He's love. God is love. Perfect love. The more if we let that sink in, maybe we'll learn to trust him as the author. He loves me and everything he says and every way he guides me is out of that love for me. And that's the good news that so we have to get out, let people know. You'll need to fight, to fight against this one. He's the author who is love, the author of your life. There's a song, the king of love my shepherd is, his goodness faileth never. You know, he is mine and I am his, and do that and do us forever. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, remind us every day who you are that you are not just a God who loves us, but you are love itself. Lord, open our hearts, Father, to receive your love. Open our hearts, Lord, to, to, to allow your Holy Spirit to truly um, uh, lead and guide us, that we might trust you. Uh, and so, Lord, enrich our faith in you today. Strengthen our hope in our future with you. Increase our trust in you. And above all, inflame our love for you and one another so that the world may believe that we are your disciples. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thanks, everybody.